Hello, I'm Catherine Nicholson. You are watching Talking Europe on France 24 today with France's Minister for European Affairs, Nathalie Loiseau. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Well, uh, as Europe Minister, you of course have relations with 27 other countries, mm -hmm. at least, to handle. Uh, but one currently is dominating. Uh, there are just six months to go until the UK is due to leave the EU. As things stand, there's, there's no deal of any kind on the withdrawal agreement, the future relationship, anything. And a no-deal scenario is still seen as possible. This week, you've laid out plans to use decree powers, ordonnance in French, to rush through a, a raft of new laws mm -hmm. to try and minimise chaos here in France, if I can put it that way. Uh, lots of viewers are wanting more information mm. about this. So let's start there. Uh, d do you feel with certainty that France is ready for March 30th, 2019? More than 80% of the text of the agreement is agreed mm -hmm. between the UK and the European Union. So one, one last effort and we are able to make it. Uh, and I do hope that it is what is going to happen. This decrees that I uh, presented to the Council of Ministers this week, I wish I will not have to use them. Mm -hmm. But in case there is no withdrawal agreement, I have to be ready uh, to uh, protect the uh, interests of the French citizens, of the British citizens living in France, and of the freedom of circulation between the United Kingdom and France through mm -hmm. the Channel. And of course we will be ready, and of course there won't be chaos. With this preparation from France, do you believe that a no-steel scenario is likely to happen? Um, I, sh I wish this is not what is going to happen, but I noticed that the British authorities have also published a number of notes mm -hmm. of what is going to happen in case of a no deal. So this is a question of political responsibility to prepare for all sorts of scenarios. It is possible. Because until now, we don't have a withdrawal agreement. The moment we have one, we need it to be ratified by the British Parliament and by the European Parliament. Mm. So uh, the clock is ticking. Six months is tomorrow. And we would have to strike a deal much earlier than in, that in its six months. We have to use the next European Council in October mm to find an agreement. Well, I've had lots of questions from people on social media about uh -huh. uh, what you've been announcing in the last few days, particularly citizens' rights. Many, many French people in the UK, many Brits here in France, as well as elsewhere in Europe. So uh, this one I've picked out from Benjamin Gear. Uh, it covers quite a lot of the worries, I think. He says, exactly what rights are Britons in France going to get? Which is quite a lot of ground I know to cover. When will we see this in writing? If there's no deal, will France wait to see what the UK does about EU citizens there, or will it act first to protect the rights of Britons in France, even if the UK doesn't uh, give reciprocal action? The first question was about what are the rights that the uh, British citizens are going to keep mm -hmm. in case there is a withdrawal agreement. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that is, is the first thing that we agreed on. Mm -hmm. with the British authorities when we worked on the withdrawal agreement. And it's a very uh, comprehensive part of the withdrawal agreement. Uh, British citizens living in Europe are able to uh, stay, study, work, mm -hmm. have their social benefits protected in the same manner as uh, before, uh, as being citizens of a European state. That's under the withdrawal agreement. That's under the withdrawal about agreement. The no deal scenario. Uh, what we have in mind in case of a no deal is to try to protect the same rights mm -hmm. at the same level. And we uh, push for the British authorities to have the same ambition. I discussed it with Dominic Robb the last time I was in London, uh, and he give assurances that the presence of mm -hmm. European citizens in the UK was precious to the Euro British economy to mm -hmm. begin with mm -hmm. and that rights would be protected. But indeed, in case we have a no deal, I want to know first what is going to be the fate of the French citizens. This is my first responsibility and adapt 
what is going to be provided to the British citizens, who are indeed precious for our economy, precious in many parts of France. Will there be a distinction between people who have been here for a long time? Perhaps mm -hmm. uh, some people who contacted me saying, I, I did used to work in France, I've stayed here for my retirement, I'm now too old to work, I'm unable to work for other reasons. Can they stay? People are worried if they're going to be kicked out. For no, of words. course we want them to stay and to have the benefits that they have currently. And at what point will they dis discover the, the reality of this, the, the legal well, reality? We have not uh, put online details of the status because we don't know whether there, there is a withdrawal agreement or not mm. and we don't want to create confusion. We will put things online so that people are fully accompanied and find proper information. And just to really underline this point, uh, France not at this point prepared to guarantee legally the rights of British citizens already here in France. You're waiting for a withdrawal agreement to be agreed or no deal? No, they declare. will have rights and the maximum possible rights. Mm -hmm. If there is a withdrawal agreement, we already know what sort of rights are protected and it is basically the rights that they are having currently. And we wish for an ambitious solution. If we don't have a deal, the question of our citizens in the UK and of British citizens in France is, of course, a priority. Uh, on Wednesday, we heard more from Theresa May herself at the Conservative Party's conference in Birmingham. Rhoda Abbas has this report. The British Prime Minister appeared to take everything in her stride as she shuffled her way onto the stage. Her tongue-in-cheek comments on the failings of last year's speech appeared to please the crowds. Now, uh, can I just say, you will have to excuse me if I do cough during the speech. <laughs> I've been up all night supergluing the backdrop. Despite constant murmurs of a leadership challenge within her party, she reiterated that she was not going anywhere. Leadership is doing what you believe to be right and having the courage and determination to see it through. And that is the approach I have taken on Brexit. My job as Prime Minister is to do what I believe to be in the national interest. Mrs May urged her party to unite behind her as she continues to push ahead with her Chequers plan, which she said has entered the toughest phase of negotiations. She reiterated her terms and promised to honour democracy by ruling out a second referendum. So this is our proposal taking back control of our borders, laws and money. Good for jobs, good for the union, it delivers on the referendum, it keeps faith with the British people. The Prime Minister said Britain was not afraid to leave the EU without a deal. In the coming weeks, she is set to return to Brussels in hopes of reaching a final agreement before the March deadline. Indeed, that deadline zooming towards us, Nathalie Oloazo. Uh, just speaking about Theresa May there, as we heard in the report, efforts to unite her party behind herself. But there has been a lot of speculation in the UK recently about a possible uh, general election, national elections, uh, or a leadership challenge to Theresa May. Now, from your point of view on this EU side of the table, what would a general election mean for the process? Wouldn't it be a bit of a disaster coming at this late stage? You know, I'm not speculating on a British domestic politics. We are working with the uh, British government respectfully. Uh, we listen carefully to what uh, Prime Minister May says. Uh, and we wish that the British authorities do listen carefully as well to what the 27 heads of state mm -hmm. and government said in Salzburg. That is that we want a good deal, that currently uh, the proposal made by the white paper uh, is not a basis for an agreement. The Chequers deal. The Taker's proposal, proposal. Uh, uh, would threaten the functioning of the European Union. Mm. So we fully respect the integrity of the United Kingdom, but of course an agreement has to respect the integrity of the single market. 
Well, I know you don't want to speculate, but I'm going to try and make you do it. What if the negotiating partner in the UK was not Theresa May, but Labour's Jeremy Corbyn, uh, who favours the UK staying in some kind of a customs union with the EU? Surely from the EU side, that really is a preferable option. Uh, the preferable option is the balanced one. The one which balances rights and obligations. Uh, we never wanted the UK to leave the European Union, but we respect the, 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 the democratic decision of the United Kingdom. Uh, starting from that point of view, we simply say that the next, the future relationship has to be balanced. Mm. The more rights the UK is looking for, the more obligations it has to abide with. This is simple. You can have a free trade agreement, you can have an enriched free trade agreement, you can have the situation of Norway, but you cannot have the benefits of Norway with the obligation of Canada, for instance. Mm. This doesn't make sense. All right, I'd just like to move briefly on then to what's going on inside your own government here in Paris. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had the president reluctantly accepting the resignation of the interior minister mm -hmm. on the, the second presentation of that resignation. Uh, is this a government in crisis? It's the second ministerial departure in a couple of weeks. Uh, compared to many governments uh, throughout Europe, uh, I can tell you that we have a government at work, that we have a strong majority in the parliament, that we are uh, passing important reforms. So no, it's not a crisis. It's a personal decision from a minister who uh, wants to be mayor of his uh, hometown again. Being a minister myself, it's a 24-7 sort of job. I don't see how I could do something else at the same time. Uh, the European Parliament uh, has just voted to withhold 70 million euros of funding from Turkey mm -hmm. over human rights uh, breaches. Now, at the same time, Turkey is still a, a very important partner to the EU on its migration deal. Uh, it's received 3 billion euros for that. If there are these serious concerns about human rights breaches, does that throw the migration deal into doubt? Um, it, the, the concerns we have on human rights are uh, among the reasons why negotiations with Turkey on its uh, candidacy to join the European U Union are making no progress. Regarding the status of refugees uh, being uh, in Turkey, uh, we have provided local authorities and NGOs in Turkey with the 3 billion euros you were mentioning, which is to say that it's not a blank check given to the, uh, the Turkish government. And we uh, respect what has been done by Turkey to uh, welcome these refugees. They have health insurance. Their children go to school in Turkey. And Turkey is really making a huge effort, and we have to recognize it. The numbers of migrants arriving in Europe are drastically down. Right. Uh, but there are, for example, uh, the Aquarius mm -hmm. rescue ship uh, can no longer operate in the Mediterranean, it seems. Uh, and there are still shipwrecks in the Mediterranean. There have mm -hmm. been uh, more than 1,000 deaths this year. There is a school of thought that says that uh, preventing rescue ships like the Aquarius from operating in the Mediterranean is actually what European governments want. They want a deterrent to people trying to cross the Mediterranean to try and claim asylum in Europe. Uh, not at all. Uh, what Europe wants is to prevent smugglers, human traffickers, uh, from making money with misery and uh, people who are fleeing war and persecutions. And indeed, we are working, for instance, in Africa, in Chad, in Niger, to make sure that uh, our asylum officers meet people. And if they deserve asylum, if they have a, a, a clear chance of becoming political refugees, mm. they are uh, sent to Europe through planes, not giving their money to human traffickers. Uh, regarding the, the situation of Aquarius, it hasn't lost uh, its flag yet. And one has to be clear uh, about the reason why uh, SOS Mediterranean is afraid of losing its flag is because of the behavior of one member state, and this is Italy. Italy has shut its harbors, mm. and Italy has threatened Panama 
uh, about the uh, flag of the Aquarius. Well, Until the now, the Aquarius mm. still has a flag, mm. is looking for another to be able to work in the Mediterranean Sea. Is uh, France, as a government, prepared to offer help to SOS Mediterranean, the operators of the Aquarius? They have not asked for a French flag nor a German flag until now. We are in frequent discussion with SOS Mediterranean because, as you know, the recent uh, arrival in Malta was organized by a number of member states of goodwill, mm -hmm. France, Spain, Portugal, Uh, Germany and Malta, and we are welcoming 18 of uh, the asylum seekers who were on the uh, Aquarius on this occasion. All right, unfortunately we are running out of time, but before we end the show, I'd just like to take a look at uh, some fake news from around the continent, a regular feature on our programme. Russian business news site Gazette.ru recently reported that Angela Merkel publicly snubbed Theresa May at the informal summit in Salzburg on September 20th. The article states that the German Chancellor deliberately, quote, humiliated the British Prime Minister by refusing to shake her hand. A video that's also posted does indeed show Mrs Merkel approaching a group of heads of state and not greeting Mrs May in the process, even though she was standing right in front of her. Well, according to the website, Angela Merkel was taking revenge for Brexit. But anyone who watched the whole day's coverage would know that the two women had in fact met and spoken earlier in the day and therefore had no need to say another hello at this later point. Fact checkers at another Russian website, The Insider, have also written about Gazeta's misleading account of the meeting. Well, that does bring us to the end of this part of the programme. Nathalie Loiseau, our guest, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And do stay tuned. Coming up in part two, we will be in Norway speaking to Foreign Minister Ina Eriksson Søreide about Brexit, climate change and security threats from the East.